people today have any mental picture of Methodism. This painting by L.S. Lowry of a chapel on the corner of a grimy street in a northern mill town probably comes close to summing it up. Red-bricked and soot-stained, austere and forbidding. However, to tell the story of the rise of this now largely forgotten mass movement, I've brought you not to the city of Salford in Lancashire, but to a small village in Bedfordshire that shares its name. Hello, I'm Jonathan Rodell, and this nondescript, long-abandoned building behind me is Salford Methodist Chapel. In 1851, a census of church attendance found 120 people crammed into it for the evening service. It's 40% of the village population. And if we take into account those who may have attended the two services earlier in the day, Methodists probably formed a majority of the village community. In fact, Methodism was stronger in this stretch of country, between the Chilterns and the River Ouse, than anywhere else in England. The history of Methodism is a complex and often highly localised story. There were many Methodisms in many places at many times, as one historian has put it. But the story of Methodism in this rural stronghold casts a new light on the history of the movement as a whole. The story of Methodism begins in the early 18th century and as part of a new religious mood that swept through Northern Europe and North America. There was a turning away from an emphasis on the mind and towards instead an emphasis on the heart. It appeared first in Silesia among Protestants who had ended up on the wrong side of Europe's religious Iron Curtain and then, quite independently it seems, among the colonists of New England. Here in Britain, the earliest accounts of this new, emotionally charged spirituality come from isolated communities in Wales and sleepy English country towns like Bedford. We're outside St Paul's, the largest of Bedford's ancient parish churches. Externally, at least, it's not changed much since 1736, when Francis Oakley, a 17-year-old recently returned from boarding school, formed a society for those interested in being earnest in their religion. When Bedford was threatened two years later by an outbreak of smallpox, interest in Oakley's society went viral. Hundreds crowded into the yard of Mother Oakley's house to hear preachers exhorting them to flee from the wrath to come. By 1744, things had already settled down again, but the society had established itself with 140 members. Rejected both by the Church of England and by the local Baptist community, Oakley's society applied instead to join a new denomination. Formed in Saxony by refugees from Catholic persecution in what we would now call the Czech Republic, it called itself the unity of the brethren, but it's generally named after the homeland of its founders, the Moravians. Looking for land on which to settle, groups of Moravians migrated from Germany to Britain's American colonies, a journey that brought them to London and into contact with societies like Oakley's across England. Under Moravian guidance, the society brought land on what was then the edge of Bedford where they built a settlement in which their followers could live and work and worship together separated from the sinful world. The settlement was engulfed by the expansion of the town many years ago and what remains of its buildings are today part of Bedford School. So we've come a few miles to the north of Bedford to a later Moravian settlement at Pertonwall. We're in the burial ground, God's Acre as the Moravians would have called it where the faithful lie waiting for Judgment Day, the women on one side and the men on the other, just as they sat separately in church on Sundays. The individual graves are marked by simple slate stones. 
these plain markers decrying any ostentation or worldly distinction. Discipline in a Moravian settlement was strict. There was a busy schedule of daily devotional meetings and members' lives were minutely regulated down to the clothes they wore, the jobs they did and the people they married. Members were not even allowed to leave the settlement without permission from the leaders. One of the members who was excluded for breaking these rules was a Bedford grocer and alderman called William Parker. Nothing daunted, he set about founding his own society and made contact with a London-based clergyman who'd also fallen out with the Moravians, John Wesley. Wesley and his followers are often presented as an evangelistic missionary movement. But the truth is that, like the Moravians, they were much more concerned with disciplining their own lives than converting others. Indeed, the signature of the movement was not open-air preaching, as later generations would fantasise, but a private confessional held behind closed doors called the class meeting. Wesleyans may not have lived in separate settlements like the Moravians, but they were just as keen to keep a distance from their worldly neighbours. Men of worldly, low design, let not these thy people join, poison our simplicity, drag us from our trust in thee, never let the world break in, fix a mighty gulf between, keep us little and unknown, prized and loved by God alone. By the 1750s, religious societies had cropped up all over Bedfordshire. This is Everton in the east of the county. The vicar here, a man called John Berridge, went through his own crisis and conversion in 1758. He began to preach a new style of sermon, full of the threat of fires of hell. And it drew vast crowds. People walked up to 20 miles through Saturday night to be here for Sunday morning. This is a very quiet spot now, but in Berridge's day, during the services, the scene was anything but quiet. One of the eyewitnesses uh, records... There was a loud breathing, like that of people half strangled and gasping for life, and indeed almost all the cries were like those of human creatures, dying in a bitter anguish. Great numbers wept without any noise, others fell down as dead, some sinking in silence, some with extreme noise and agitation. Every Monday morning, Berridge and a team of assistants fanned out across Bedfordshire, Hertfordshire and Cambridgeshire, holding services in over 40 barns and farmhouses. These societies joined neither the Moravian Church nor Wesley's connection. But like most of the groups that had formed across England and Wales, and who were by now called Methodists, they looked instead for leadership to George Whitfield and after his death to a number of clergymen and wealthy lay people who maintained an informal association through correspondence and preaching tours. Moravian, Whitfieldite, Wesleyan. By the 1780s all the varieties of Methodism were experiencing similar problems. Recruitment was drying up, members were getting older numbers were in decline. Many village societies disappeared altogether and at Huntingdon and Hartford purpose-built preaching rooms were shut up and abandoned. Methodism's moment, it seemed, had come to an end. But in fact, the movement's fortunes were about to be transformed. John Berridge died peacefully in his bed in January 1793, just one day after Louis XVI met a much more violent end in Paris. The revolution that swept Louis from power heralded more than 20 years of war for Britain, and the economic boom created by the army and navy's voracious appetite for men and materials 
brought about a revolution of another kind in the fortunes and the very nature of Methodism. This is Ebenezer, a Wesleyan chapel, built in 1804 in the village of Tempsford. It's uh, probably the oldest surviving Methodist church in the county. It was largely the project of one man, Samuel Bennett, a local farmer, who, perhaps because he wasn't a local man, seems to have found it difficult to achieve the kind of um, place and respect in the local community that he clearly thought his financial success deserved. By building this neat chapel, not simply uh, a little room in which Methodists could hold their private meetings, but a place of public worship that anyone in the village could come to, he created a new social space in the community in which he could take a leading role. Here on the wall is the memorial to Bennett, and as the chapel was originally conceived, his family's box pew probably occupied this space to the right of the pulpit, with a, a matching box pew uh, to the left uh, for another of the principal subscribers to the chapel's cost. And here on a Sunday morning, close to the pulpit, he and his family would have taken their place visible to the village community as a picture of respectability. Up in the gallery, uh, a band of village musicians with viols, clarinets and serpents and a choir of singers to lead the hymn singing in the worship. And with the new band and choir, a new style of hymn singing that gave great life and energy to Methodist meetings. In the pulpit, not yet the lay preachers for which Methodism would later become famous, but at this point, mainly professionals, paid for with the growing collections in this time of economic prosperity. So a neat chapel with attractive music, with a professional preacher, everything that the aspiring young person might want to associate with themselves with. With the opening of a chapel like this, suddenly it no longer became necessary to be a member of the tightly disciplined midweek class meeting that was a feature of 18th century Methodism. You could come along just on a Sunday to listen to the preacher and join in the singing. Numbers soared and chapels like this were soon full to overflowing. One of the reasons why Methodism grew particularly here in Bedfordshire may have been linked to the fact that the local economy gave women additional opportunities to earn their own pay. Either making lace or plaiting straw for the straw hat trade in Luton and Dunstable. Women had always been in the majority, not only in Methodist congregations, but in congregations of all denominations. And with money in their pocket, the local women here were more able to afford the collection and subscription fees of belonging to chapels. This was the sort of Methodist congregation that William Cobbett stumbled upon travelling through Kent. It was a Methodist parson. Do you know, said he, laying great stress on the word no, do you know that you have ready for you houses? Houses, I say. I say, do you know... Do you know that you have houses in the heavens not made with hands? Do you know this from experience? Some girls whom I saw in the room, plump and rosy as could be, did not seem at all daunted by these menaces. And indeed, they appeared to me to be thinking much more about getting houses for themselves in this world first, just to see a little before they entered or endeavoured to enter, or even thought much about those houses of which the parson was speaking. To be a Methodist was to be morally and spiritually superior. To be connected with a community that was on the up, successful in worldly terms, because providentially blessed. And if you joined, who knows, but some of that blessing might rub off on you. Back in the 18th century, Methodists had hidden from the world. The little preaching room in Luton, 
built in 1778, was carefully hidden down a side alley, and its anonymous, windowless facade offered no clue as to its purpose. But the chapel built to replace it in 1814 was clearly of a very different order. Prominently located on a main street, self-consciously impressive, dignified and rather smart. The Wesleyans were not the only religious community to benefit from the surge in evangelical piety during the war years. Older dissenting traditions like the Baptists and the Congregationalists also experienced a fresh lease of life. But the Wesleyans were the main beneficiaries, perhaps because their centralised organisation allowed them to channel money and manpower into emerging markets like South Bedfordshire far more quickly than any of their competitors. Where there had been two full-time preachers allocated to Bedfordshire and the surrounding counties in 1789, by 1815 there were 30. More preachers meant that there was Methodist preaching in more places. Geographic expansion brought in more members. More members meant more money, and more money paid for more preachers. It was a virtuous spiral, and a bubble that was about to burst. When the war ended, Britain experienced a period of prolonged economic downturn. There were fewer yuppies looking for opportunities to express their newfound respectability. The money for chapels dried up, and Methodist membership began once again to fall away. <laughs> The early years of the 1830s brought no economic relief to rural areas like Bedfordshire. And across southern England, acts of violence by hungry and desperate people against farmers and landowners multiplied. Demands for higher wages and lower prices, signed by Captain Swing, circulated widely. At Tollpuddle in Dorset, the labourers famously tried to organise a trade union. And at Bossenden Wood in Kent, they fought a pitched battle against government troops in which 11 people died. There was rioting in a number of Bedfordshire villages and there was also a huge upsurge in attendance at Wesleyan services. Accounts from the time are full of references to chapels, barns and cottages overflowing with new congregations. At Slapton, near Leighton Buzzard, defection from the Church of England was so complete that it was said that services in the parish church were abandoned and that the building itself was locked up for months on end. This was a form of communal protest that struck at the heart of the established authorities in English rural society, the squire and the parson, and it had the advantage of being entirely legal. Particularly popular, we're told, were the prayer meetings and love feasts where any man was free to stand up and have his say. The landlords and some of the farmers were prayed for by name. Cursed is he who removeth his neighbour's landmark, and oppresseth the poor and needy, and joineth land to land, and stoppeth footpaths. These sentences always met with hearty amens. This is the Wesleyan Chapel at Biggleswade, built in 1834, at the very height of this third wave of Methodist growth in Bedfordshire. It looks a bit grand to be a temple of the poor, and that's because it wasn't. Wesleyan Methodism was an essentially conservative movement, and although thrilled by the sudden surge of converts, the leadership of the community moved quickly to silence any expressions of social protest. New rules were introduced to govern prayer meetings, lay preachers were brought under stricter supervision, and love feasts were curtailed. Above all, a major building programme was launched to bring new congregations out of the cottages and barns in which they were meeting into respectable chapels owned and controlled by middle-class trustees. For the next generation, the task of servicing the mortgages on these chapels would become the overwhelming priority of the Wesleyan community. Tea meetings, concerts and bazaars, polite social gatherings that would have been anathema to the Puritan spirit of early Methodism, 
entered into the calendar of many chapels. Attendance, however, at Wesleyan worship slumped, as many of those who had crowded into the services in the early 1830s drifted away again. Most of those who abandoned Wesleyanism in the 1840s probably gave up on organised religion altogether. Some may have returned to the Church of England, but others joined new breakaway Methodist groups. This chapel in Bedford, almost lost now behind later buildings, was erected in 1832 for a long-forgotten Methodist sect called the Primitive Episcopal Church. Its minister, the Reverend Timothy Matthews, a renegade Church of England clergyman and Cambridge graduate, was apparently a powerful preacher who offered his predominantly working-class followers the hope of miraculous interventions and the imminent return of Jesus to transform an unjust world. From 1837, Matthews faced competition from another Methodist-related sect in which some of his wife's Wesleyan relatives had become prominent members, the Latter-day Saints. Combining a millenarian message not very different to Matthews with a practical offer of assisted emigration to the Promised Land in America, the Mormons found their principal source of recruits among disillusioned working-class Wesleyans. The most successful of the new Methodist groups, however, offered a quite different panacea, a gospel of self-improvement. The primitive Methodist connection originated in the work of two Staffordshire men, Hugh Bourne and William Clowes, and spread to Bedfordshire in the late 1830s. Utilising the latest American revival techniques, it proved particularly successful in Luton, where it established a large following in the new working-class district of Hightown and built this substantial chapel in 1851. Primitive Methodism is sometimes presented as a reaction against the respectability of Wesleyanism, but in fact it simply provided the same social space for the aspiring working man that Wesleyanism provided for the middle classes. Opportunities for status, to exercise leadership, to mark oneself out from the common herd. Not surprisingly, the Prims were zealous enthusiasts of temperance, a cause that provided a clear and visible dividing line between the feckless and the respectable poor. But even adding the membership of these smaller Methodist communities to the Wesleyan total, Methodism was still smaller by the end of the 1840s than it had been in the mid-1830s, and in fact, it never recovered that level of popularity. By 1900, although some chapels continued to thrive, village chapels like Salford were already beginning to close, a process that continues to this day. Looking at Salford Chapel today, it stretches the imagination to recover the warmth and enthusiasm, activity and excitement, life and energy which this building and thousands like it across England and Wales once witnessed. But as we end our wander through Bedfordshire's Methodist history, perhaps the words of the Welsh poet R.S. Thomas can conjure up some distant, lingering echoes of a world that has almost disappeared. A little aside from the main road, becalmed in a last century greyness, there is the chapel, ugly, without the appeal to the tourist to stop his car and visit it. The traffic goes by, and the river goes by, and quick shadows of clouds too, and the chapel settles a little deeper into the grass. But here, once, on an evening like this, in the darkness that was about his hearers, a preacher caught fire and burned steadily before them with a strange light, so that they saw the splendour of the barren mountains about them, and sang their amens fiercely, narrow but saved, in a way that men are not now. <laughs>